box available if there's any questions that come up during the call. You may have some questions for the Garrett Green team. Uh, I'm sure you'll have some questions for Colby later in the call, but feel free to use that chat box so that we can have a real conversation together. Uh, and we appreciate you making the time for this monthly call. I will say this later, but I'll go ahead and say it now. The August call is not gonna happen. Uh, so we're gonna take a bit of a break until September. So I'll, I'll repeat that again and you'll probably get an email from me again also. But anyway, just to, just to go ahead and put that out there. Um, so Tim, are all of your uh, Green Team members that are gonna join us on this call, are they, are they on? I, I think so. There, there may be one more who might join, but um, my guess is if he was going to join, he would have, he would have uh, been, been in the room by now. So we can, we okay. can certainly proceed if that would be helpful. That'd be great. You know, part of, the, part of the point of this is to get to know each other and to build some relationships so that we can get more comfortable sharing some ideas and learning together and encouraging one another. So uh, it's important to us to hear from each of our schools uh, as to how the certification process is going, um, what sources of pride, what sources of frustration there may be, and any helpful ideas that you've kind of uh, discovered or stumbled across that you, that you think would be good to share. So, Tim, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you and tell us how things are going at Garrett. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and it looks like we, we may, yes, we do. We've got uh, Ed Kenchola who'll be joining us as well. So I think we've got our full team, uh, at least those who are able to be present today. So uh, my name is Tim Eberhardt. I'm uh, assistant uh, professor of theology and ecology at Garrett Evangelical. Um, and I'm going to share a bit about curriculum, faculty, uh, 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 matters in terms of our strategic plan and then a, a bit about a, a fundraising campaign and then I'll turn it to, over to other members of the campaign or of, of the green team. Um, so uh, one of the one of the major items ahead for us is the launch this fall of an ecological regeneration concentration that will be part of a new MA in public ministry that we're also launching this this fall. I'm, uh, I will be directing the, the new MA in public ministry and I'll be overseeing the ecological regeneration concentration. Uh, the MA will also have concentrations in uh, possibilities in racial justice and child advocacy. Uh, and we'll be working to integrate those, those concentrations through other courses that students will share in that degree. That said, uh, students in our MDiv, our MTS and other, some, a certain other degrees will also be able to access the courses in that concentration generally uh, and will, can choose if they so opt to, to earn a concentration in, in that, that area. So um, some of the courses we will have taught before, uh, ecological theology and an environmental ethics class, uh, but there'll be two new courses as well that'll be part of that uh, uh, the concentration one in uh, uh, ecologic uh, racial ecology and environmental justice, and then a fourth that uh, we're quite excited about. We're uh, going to be partnering with Faith in Place, which is the Illinois chapter of Interfaith Power and Light, um, to teach to help us teach that fourth course uh, that'll have a much more practical Chicago regional focus. Um, and uh, so we're, there'll be quite a bit of work just getting those, um, those courses and that concentration launched. Right now, it looks like we've got uh, eight for sure entering in the new MA, uh, four to five of those who've uh, chosen to concentrate in ecological regeneration, uh, and perhaps two to three more uh, before we, we, we start this fall. Uh, so we'll be identifying field ed sites, um, we'll continue in conversations with several of our seminary and divinity school partners in the Chicago area. Uh, in particular, LSTC, uh, uh, Dr. Barbara Rossing and I have had several conversations about how, <clears throat> how to draw upon the resources of, of both of our schools in, in, in uh, greater collaboration. Uh, 
with that, we're also at the same time launching a uh, fundraising campaign to support a variety of uh, ecologically related initiatives. Uh, one, a, an, an endow, uh, endowed chair in ecological theology, uh, another part, uh, an endowed center for ecological regeneration, third, uh, endowed scholarships for students in an eco cohort. Uh, whether they're in the concentration or other other aspects of, of any of our degrees. Uh, and then fourth, uh, monies to support um, some of our broader hopes for the greening of our campus and our grounds. Um, I would say in terms of uh, in terms of some of my work uh, with you know certain challenges or maybe aspirations, uh, it, it will, will continue to be the, the integration of these commitments, concerns, focus across the entirety of, of the curriculum. Uh, I think we're, we're feeling good about the particular initiatives that we're launching um, and are continuing to aspire to see, to see this uh, integrated more broadly. Uh, certainly this certification process is helping us uh, in that. Uh, I've, I've had uh, several st uh, preliminary strategic conversations with our academic dean, Dean Luis Rivera, and uh, a set of key faculty members. Uh, and our current strategy is um, to use one of our, our faculty forums this coming year, a kind of a two to three hour conversation uh, of faculty on a particular matter, issue, concern, uh, and then aspiring uh, the year t 19 and 20 to kind of have a, a much broader focus across all areas, all disciplines, and drawing on the resources of our different centers for kind of a year-long focus uh, uh, on, uh, in this area of ecology, ecological justice, environmental uh, racism, climate justice, and, and related issues. Um, so yeah, I, I would say we're, uh, we've been working hard to get to the point to launch several of these initiatives and we're right at the launching point. We feel good about that. There'll be a lot of work involved, but the next step for us is going to be the kind of the integration across seminary wide. So uh, with that, let me, let me, and we can stop at the, at the end for, for questions, but let me turn to uh, Aaron Moore, who's our assistant vice president for strategic and innovative initiatives at the seminary. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm seeing nods, so that's a good sign. Um, I was going to talk about um, through Connectional Learning, which is our version of continuing education, one of the programs we have is uh, something called Garrett on the Road. And what it is is we typically have a member of our faculty, they lead um, a lecture or a workshop. It's been typically more of a workshop so far. Uh, in partnership with a church that's outside of the Evanston, Chicago area. And so we invite um, the, from the church, we invite people from the church as well as local social service organizations, uh, our alums in that area, um, prospective students, other um, members from churches nearby. Um, and uh, it's a place where we, talk about a public theology topic. And so the first one we did was in um, March of 2017. Uh, it was led by Tim and uh, it's called Hope for Creation. And there's a series of three uh, lectures and we've offered different elements to it. And um, we did a similar workshop this past year in um, Minnesota at Hem Hennepin Avenue UMC. And both have had good attendance. We're planning to do a third Hope for Creation event this year, um, September 29th, 2018, at First UMC of Whitewater. I think what's particularly great about these events is the feedback has been really positive with people saying, um, more than 80% of people saying they'll be able to use what they learned in the workshop. Um, and then, you know, more than 90% saying they felt like, um, Tim, sorry, I'm going to embarrass you a little here, maybe, but um, I, it, for Tim saying um, that he's knowledgeable on the topic and that he was able to share information in a way that they could understand and interpret. So um, that's been a great event for us. And as long as Tim's keep willing to go on the road, I think we'll continue doing that. So that's one of the ways we're kind of bringing um, seminary education to um, areas near us. So I'm gonna actually turn to Paul now to talk about uh, something we did this spring. 
Hi, everyone. Um, during our Earth Week, we were able to uh, kind of come up with this uh, bike pit stop or a free bike pit stop. And it's actually something that I had done previously with a church that I'm part of. Uh, so we kind of adapted it and did it a little differently here. Uh, one neat thing that happened recently was that the city put a, a very large bike lane right in front of our seminary. So this is this bright green uh, two-lane bike lane right in front of the school. And as you may know, we are also part of the larger Northwestern campus. So there is a lot of cyclists going by our school now more than before. And so a way to celebrate that and encourage bike commuting, uh, we had this uh, bike pit stop for a whole day. We set up a large canopy with a big old um, Garrett banner and tables with, uh, uh, with stuff. And we got some um, community partners to be part of this. We had uh, an owner from a local bike shop uh, be present with uh, a bike stand and tools, offering people uh, free maintenance on their bikes as well as, uh, as, well as um, kind of discounts for future help on their bicycles and, and uh, some, you know, bike mechanic insights to what's going on with their bikes. And we also had um, an NUPD, the police of, of uh, Northwestern. They, uh, they had one person on site to offer bike registrations, so to help prevent bike theft, as well as offering uh, free helmets to anyone who would need them. They were also selling U-locks if people wanted to purchase a lock and didn't have one or a good one. Uh, so it was really neat to have community partners come together for this event, as well as we had students and faculty and staff really all participating in this. So that was pretty neat to see people come together to promote uh, bike commuting and uh, to just serve our neighbors in that way and promote um, an ecological sound way of transportation. Um, what else did I have on that? I know the NUPD brought 26 helmets and they were out of those by the middle of the day. So we had a lot more than 26 people. I didn't count, but um, so however many that was. And it went really well, we're uh, hoping to do it again. Great. I have volunteered to share um, the report of another one of our members, um, Cassidy Hart. Oh, yeah. um, she has been focused a lot on the worship side of things. And um, I'm gonna try not to read this, but I may have to read it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so we've launched our liturgical re resource website. It's called Let Justice Roll Down. Um, the vision of it is to serve our incarnate God by envisioning a just earth, working for liberation and learning from intersectionality as we worship our creator in spirit and truth. So the website accomplishes this task by creating and curating liturgical resources uh, that call the church into ecological faithfulness. So it says, check out greenliturgy.org to discover original liturgical pieces and links to helpful resources. And if you have something to share, please contact us. And that contact us is also on the website. Um, we did a great chapel service during Earth Week. Um, so it focused on celebrating the goodness of God's creation. Uh, they chose the theme, recognizing that we usually move to action on behalf of something we love, and we wanted to connect to our community's love of their cherished wild places. So they did this through songs, visual liturgy, and an inspiring student sermon. Um, and probably the best part about um, worship, your worship services in the coming year is that the Dean of Chapel is committed to incorporating elements of echo justice into worship throughout the year and not just on these special occasions. So some of the ideas that we're working with is ecologically centered music, recurring liturgies that focus on the natural world, acknowledgement of the indigenous cultures whose land we worship on and natural, natural elements as visual art. So with that, I will pass it to Ed, who's gonna talk about our buildings and grounds. Hi, I'm Ed Conchola, Director of uh, Buildings and Grounds, and uh, my section has a lot of um, areas. So um, still gathering some data for the energy audit uh, to start the Energy Start portfolio because we get a lot of our energy from Northwestern and there's a few other par uh, parties involved to get that data. So um, 
We also, because uh, we get our water or steam heat from Northwestern, so we, uh, I'm still gathering that data, like I said. Um, in terms of grounds, we already have a landscaping company on campus and off campus that is uh, using battery operated uh, blowers, trimmers, propane mowers. Uh, so that's something that we've been slowly changing and updating uh, with them. Uh, what we're gonna start doing in the next couple of weeks is a waste audit because um, we do have a recycling program uh, here on campus, but I think we need something more sophisticated because I don't, uh, just simply labeling um, uh, the recycling bins, uh, the trash cans, uh, and having recycling bins in each individual office because uh, some of the buildings don't have them or they're not easily accessible so people won't recycle if they're it's hard to recycle which is what what i've noticed and also uh our uh, janitorial company so they i think we need to do an audit of them which we are going to to see if they're actually at the end of the day at the end of the night are they actually picking up recycling and putting it into the recycling bins so that's something we're going to be doing uh this this summer so within the next couple of weeks before school starts and in terms of energy uh i am getting a number of uh i'm thinking of updating a lot of the switches to motion sensor uh in offices so uh, it's pricey so i gotta get a number of how many offices uh and uh, common areas where we're easily able to update these so the lights turn on when people come in, lights turn off. Uh, that way we don't have to worry about people leaving their lights on uh, or having all these light bulb replacements. Um, we're also updating a few fixtures and areas from the old T8s to the, uh, from old T12s to the T8s now. Uh, and in our apartment buildings, we've upgraded a lot to LEDs now. So uh, that's a few of the things that we're working on. Um, so we'll keep you guys posted on the waste audit. That's gonna be kind of fun and see how that goes. Uh, and hopefully nobody gets offended on, no staff or uh, faculty get offended when we go through their office and go through the trash. Um, so that's pretty much uh, what I have. Awesome, thanks Ed. That's awesome. Uh, and Paul and Aaron, uh, thank you as well. So, I mean, there, there are many other things going on uh, that we're working on, um, but uh, let me just say in, to, to conclude that uh, we, we, had some, we had some good uh, initiatives and efforts underway, and we have for a few years, um, uh, but the, this, uh, the GSI audit and the strategic plan has really helped us get much more organized, uh, and so we're, we're grateful for that. We've got, got a lot of work ahead, but this has been, um, this has been a really kind of a key part of, of getting us organized and, and moving forward. So we're, we're open to, to dialogue, uh, questions, whatnot, um, if, if it would be helpful. Well, what a great report. Uh, already there's been comments about uh, loving the bike event and Abby has shared the Green Liturgy site. Uh, so we appreciate that. Thanks to all of your team. Um, uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, we do want to allow enough time for, for Colby, but real quickly, are there any questions or comments from the rest of the group for the, for the Garrett Green team? If not, thanks for what you're doing and uh, uh, appreciate your, your putting together this good report. So right now I want to introduce Colby May, who needs no introduction to this group. Uh, Colby is joining us from the Rocky Mountains, where he's been vacationing, uh, and he's taking a break from his family vacation to be with us. Um, so Colby, we appreciate you making the time. As you know, Colby is a certified energy manager, and I think has visited each of your schools that are represented on this call. Uh, performed your energy audits. Colby has has performed over 2,000 energy audits for churches and seminaries and other institutions uh, and has a real heart for missions uh, and actually sees uh, energy sustainability as a means of helping with missions. So uh, Colby, uh, 
here's a group of people that you already know, a uh, chance for you to share with them some more helpful yeah. advice on energy conservation. Good, can everybody hear me okay? And can everybody see the slides? So, okay, great, great. Well, yeah, met many of you guys, as you know, I'm a certified energy manager and actually uh, we've done about 5,000 energy audits. And before I went to seminary at Gordon-Conwell, we did seminary, we did energy audits at every school district in Texas. And, you know, Texas is almost like a nation in itself. And we have 1,100 independent school districts. Many of the school districts like Houston have 300 campuses. So that's kind of where that big number comes from. But I carried that that knowledge with me to seminary and when and focused on um, holistic missions, integral missions, uh, with Rene Padilla and a couple others, if y'all are familiar with those. And uh, I did my thesis in Congo, became really passionate about the local church and um, how ch the local church can be an avenue for change, very much like the GSI and Green Faith, uh, uh, use faith-based to uh, push forward uh, environmental issues, but I, I, I started a firm called LIT and that, that impacts missions through energy and facility management in a sense. So that's who I am and that's what I've done and I've been at many of your campuses and we've done energy audits at most of your campuses, but I wanted to kind of go through this and some of this might sound familiar, some of it might not sound familiar, but I want to kind of go through and look at what is benchmarking or utility bills and how would how does that really impact our energy use but I also want to go through um, we spend 15 20 minutes just kind of going through a quick energy audit what is HVAC lighting not just talking about it but how can we save uh, en energy in in those realms not just not just in our seminaries which is obviously our target but how can we take this to our houses of worship how can we take this to our homes etc any questions you guys you let me know or Sarah, if you need to stop me along the way to, to answer a specific question, just let me know. But I'm going to keep going. But I, I, let, me, let me say this, and then I'll move forward. Park Street was, was one of the facility managers, Park Street Church in Boston. He said something that I've always just really uh, kind of stood for when, with what we do. Fulfilling God's mission for his kingdom's sake starts with the recognition that the place where we are standing is holy ground. And when we move forward with our daily lives and missions, when we stand it, we know that this creation was his creation. He's given us the ability to steward that creation. So moving forward on the energy realm, um, I think the way we should move about that, obviously, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it needs to be in a more steward-like uh, capacity. So that's a little about me, but let me throw some quick facts at you. Uh, I know I'm talking to seminaries, but uh, financial church facts, uh, that the U.S. church, according to State of the Plate in 2013, Catholic and Protestant church, we tithe around $50 billion per year. Big number. Of that, right, $1 billion is, per year is given, about 2% is given to uh, missions, holistic missions. Whereas $10 billion a year, 20% of that, that budget is spent on utility bills and maintenance and operations of our buildings. It's a big number. Uh, but at the same time, according to the EPA, 30% of the way we use our energy is wasted, which means we can recapture that through no cost behavior change. Again, we've done a lot of audits, so we're big believers in this. And that's easier said than done, I realize it, but we can recapture 30% of that 10 billion. And if we lived in a perfect world, we could double or if not triple our missional impact. So that's kind of the, the way I move forward in, in this intersection between holistic missions and facility management, energy management. And I know I'm kind of going over a lot, but I just wanted to give you a bird's eye view of what we're talking about. I don't really need to go through this stuff, you know, just the whole aspect that God has called us to be stewards or which means managers and manager. We don't just let it happen, but we have to think strategically outside the box and being good stewards of God's creation. Quick question, and maybe we don't want to answer this, but which variable has the most impact on a building's energy consumption? Give me a few seconds. Not live, HVAC is the biggest common denominator, but behavior is the biggest, uh, it makes the most impact on a building's energy consumption, which receives the least amount of attention. You looked at lead, HVAC, lighting, or behavior. It's actually behavior. So any energy audit that we do, 
we do look at the capital expense, lighting, changing T12s to LEDs or new boiler to an older bo steam-fired boiler to a, a modular gas-fired force hot water system. But the biggest factor is behavior. So when we go in, and we'll, I'll briefly cover this, but we want to look at how does behavior impact HVAC, lighting, building envelope, et cetera. Okay. So the plan, right? Energy management is simply the, dis, uh, the discipline and the measures executed to achieve the minimum possible energy use cost while meeting the true needs and activities occurring within a facility. Here's a quick breakdown. Sorry if I'm going kind of fast, guys, uh, but breakdown, most of our energy use, if we just look at the overall uh, electric use, HVAC is 50 to 60% of our use. Now in Texas, that's a little bit more than maybe the Northeast, but you also take into account oil and gas of our energy use, HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is the biggest factor, right? Lighting is typically 20 to 30%. If you have LED, that probably drops down to 10 to 12%. Plug load, things you plug into the wall is the other 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 20%. And again, this is just an overall average. It changes based on where you are in the country. I'm going to kind of go through this slide, but there's 370,000 congregations. If we all cut energy by 20%, we'd save nearly $630 million for ministry missions education. Cut electricity by 3.6 billion kilowatts. Now we can, I'm a big believer in divestment from fossil fuels to renewable energy, but I think a first priority, and I've talked to a lot of you about this, is let's first divest. What if we can decrease our energy consumption by 10 to 15% and then start to divest the rest over to solar, renewable, et cetera. Um, we'd prevent 2.6 million tons of greenhouse gas, equivalent to 400, uh, 480,000 cars, 600,000 trees, 30% uh, would equate to $1 billion, right? So if we briefly walk through an energy audit, our influencers, HVAC, lighting, envelope, plug load, utilities, et cetera. So I'm gonna briefly walk through two churches and let's look at the HVAC. Now, I, this happens a lot. I'll walk into seminaries, I'll walk into churches, I see older systems, right? I'll see a steam, an oil-fired steam boiler. You know, sometimes you have what you have. But the efficiency right off the bat of an oil-fired steam boiler is 60%. You have leaky pipes, which means you leave another lose another 10 to 20%. So now you have a HVAC system that's operating at 50% efficiency. Oil is three times the cost of gas. Your constant volume versus variable volume. Um, if you see that picture at the bottom, that's something that we see quite often. We, the coils on your cooling, if they're bent in, this is a, this is a behavior change. You lose up to 30% of the efficiency of your unit. If uh, at a minimum, 10% of the coils are damaged. Okay, so I'm giving you just a bird's eye view, and I, I could spend a week on any one of these topics. I'm trying to leave you with something to kind of take home, um, if you can. What we might see in newer units are, uh, again, we want gas-fired forced hot water because it's a much more efficient to cleaner fuel. It gives you, you can vary the flow based on um, just being constant volume. You can modulate the boiler based on the need, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Lighting, and I was talking to the facility director. Uh, I mentioned you, you said you were gonna go from the T12s to the TH. T12s, they don't make them anymore. They're 40 watts. Many people are going over to 32, but now most of seminaries and churches are going away from the 28 watt, 32 watt T8 bulbs, the linear fluorescent T8 bulbs, and moving over to the LED, either the plug and play, and I can talk to you offline if you wanted to talk more about this or, uh, or just changing the entire fixture to LED. All right, many, a, a no cost change I see is if you go, and many times you can download this on your iPhone, a foot candle, uh, just a light check, the check of the, of the ambience and the foot candles in the, in the hallways, 90% of the time you're overlit in the hallways, 90% of the time you're overlit in the classrooms uh, IESNA, which makes the recommendation for light levels, needs, recommends 10 to 15. And in the hallways, most churches and seminaries are in the 50 range. So there's, a, there's opportunities to de-lamp there. I could go on and talk more uh, on lighting, but I just want to give you 
a few things. Um, again, delamping, daylight. If you're gone from your classroom or your office longer than 23 seconds, it pays to turn off your lights. And that was done by MythBuster, so it's got to be accurate, right? It's got to be accurate. <laughs> Uh, we did a, now we're looking, moving over to building envelope. Uh, we did a study at Harvard Divinity School. And if you look at the bottom picture there, that's a thermal or that's a single pane versus a double pane. And there was an eight degree delta. So using storm windows, using upgrading to double pane windows, you can see the compromise in your building envelope and your HVAC has to work that much harder in order to maintain that. There's other things like weather stripping on, under doors, et cetera, that also make a big impact on your building envelope. Plug load, the only thing I'll say about this, things you plug into the wall, that if plug load makes up 20% of your electric source, 75% of that is called phantom load. So even when the device is off or not being used, 75% of the power is still coming in. It's called phantom load. You can get plug load adapters. I write that in the in the audit report. Uh, there's plug load adapters that can help to minimize. Uh, other things that we see on plug load is thermostats. They'll be right underneath a copier machine or a computer that computer rejects heat, causes that th thermostat to misread and your HVAC is running more than it should. So location of thermostats are also important. I'm gonna keep moving forward. Really, my last two sections here is talking about behavior. And I'm also going to talk about uh, uh, benchmarking. When we're talking about behavior, these are things that we can do just on the HVAC portion that can make a very large, I would say 20 to 30% of your HVAC use can be modified just by adjusting some thermostats. And from a facility management point of view, I understand that you have the energy management hat, but you also have to make people happy and you don't want people to be uncomfortable. So there's obviously a compromise that takes place when we're talking about behavior and controls. Um, but let me move. One of the things that we see is scheduling. For example, I'll go, I'll go into a church in a seminary and maybe one person will come into the church, but turn the entire HVAC system on just to maintain that, uh, that room, even though they have the ability to zone and you know, look at air handling units, so on and so forth. So, uh, scheduling, I'm actually going to go back and talk about one more thing, but the ability to zone is a, makes a large impact on your use. Um, dead band is, is also an, another thing. Dead band is if I have my cooling set at 72, if I have my heating set at 68, that's called a two degree dead band. And what I'm doing is I'm simultaneously heating and cooling my building. We're going to send these slides to you after this. So if you don't want to take notes and just capture this information, I know I'm going really fast, kind of like drinking from a fire hose possibly, but <laughs> if uh, every degree you adjust your temperature, you can save 1.5% on the HVAC portion of your bill. So adjusting from 72 to 74 or vice versa on heating actually makes a large impact. And back to the dead band, I would recommend, a five degree to six degree dead band, not a two degree dead band. Hmm. In seminaries, many, many of the apartments uh, that the students live in are, are on seminaries, they don't pay their electric bill, they don't pay their energy bill. So they're much more inclined to leave it on. That's something on the HVAC portion that we, I was on the green team at Gordon Conwell. So we did a lot of stuff during chapel that would really talk and encourage students just to be good stewards. Of, of those portions of their buildings as well. I mean, I, I don't want to go over this. Uh, I mean, occupied times and unoccupied times, that's a big thing as well, especially if you're in a colder environment and you set your unoccupied temperature, say from 68 heating to 64 or 65, which I see a lot, that's still causing that boiler to run 24 hours a day at times. So being as aggressive as possible, and facility managers know their buildings better than anybody else, and they know what that number is. But being as aggressive as you can on your unoccupied temperatures makes a big impact. 55 heating, 85 cooling if you can, was, is what EPA recommends. There's other things here. I don't have time to go through all of it. 
Uh, Sarah, about, about two, three more minutes and I'm done here. Okay. And I'm not doing I'm on sure time. Uh, okay, two, three good. more minutes. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the last section. Benchmarking, uh, how are we doing and how do we know, all right? Uh, two questions, how are we doing, how do we know? Put simply, benchmarking is a process of comparing your energy performance to something similar. For example, it's like a gas gauge to a car. When you know what you have in the tank, you make better informed decisions. 99% um, of the time I work with facility managers. It's just encouraging them to gauge and measure their utility use, your portfolio manager, and I'll talk about that here in a second, or other things. Um, EPA says benchmarking a facility can save 2.5 to 7% per year. It empowers facility managers and team by identifying peaks, valleys, errors, and more. For example, this is a typical school, say K through 12 school that I was working at a church. If you're looking at their energy use, um, you're looking at January, March, April, June, July. If I had everybody's audio, I mean, what, what would you say is wrong with this picture? Right off the bat, it's a school. Schools don't operate in the summer months, June, July, and August. Okay, why are you operating your utility use during June, July, and August? They didn't need to. They had their outside air dampers open, had this hot Houston air coming in to the building during peak time, and then they would have to wring that humidity out of the air by bringing their cooling on and, and, make, and bringing it down to 32 degrees to wring the humidity out of the air. A, a common uh, practice and, and fixes that is to move the uh, humidity or dehumidification process from peak times to early in the morning and to close those outside air dampers because there's nobody in the room and they didn't need to have them open. So that was a no cost. That one impact saved that school $60,000 in energy savings. All they did was they moved from peak demand time to early in the morning. I can talk about that. Um, but they also closed their outside air dampers. I know there's a lot of information. But that's the that we showed. Um, 40 to, yeah, they just their summer costs alone went from 80,000 to 40,000 by reducing the way they operated during the summer months. That's a no cost behavior change. Um, I, I won't get into this too much, but two things I want you to know is kilowatt hours is the consumption, is the amount of energy you use during a 30 day power or 30 day cycle. Kilowatts is the rate at which you use electricity, and if you look at your bills you all have a kilowatt time. So if I was to break up my, my month into 15 minute sections, your utility bill will find the highest 15 minute section and that's what you're charged for for the month. So even if you average 200, then all of a sudden you turn everything on, that 200 moves to 350 just for a, what, 15 minutes. You're not charged the 200 or the average, you're charged the 350. So the way you use energy between the hours of 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. makes a huge impact on energy savings, on energy reduction, et cetera. Again, any one of these things I'm talking about now to give a week long class on. So I, I'm sorry this is a lot of information. Just trying to give it to you and see where it goes. This is the last slide. Portfolio Manager, it's a free program. We've already paid for it through your tax money. So you don't have to pay any more, but portfolio manager is an excellent way uh, that the EPA actually came up where you can measure your benchmark, you, you can measure your electric use, including KWH, cost, demand, demand cost, your gas, your water, your wastewater. You can capture, you can build a baseline year and then you can show savings. Say you implement, like you said, you're going from T12s to T8. You want to see what the savings are you can start to benchmark into portfolio manager and it'll show you, you can, there's so much you can do with it, but um, you know, there's seven, there's 75, there's actually closer to 90,000 accounts today. Um, and there's so much you can do with it, including graphs that you can share with your green team. You can build goals, et cetera, on, on that. But again, that's a lot of information. And I haven't stopped talking, but uh, that's it. Let me hand it back over to you, Sarah. And what, what questions do you guys have? Thanks, Colby. That's a whole lot of information. That's really a lot. Helpful. I'm sorry.
No, that's good. It's all good. Uh, I appreciate you touching on portfolio manager because so it's, that is one of the uh, requirements that we've written in to the certification standards. And some of our schools are on it, some of our schools are not yet. But uh, it's important for us to uh, learn what all that it does offer and how it can help us. Um, we also uh, want to hear from you, the schools, about how you've used the energy audit and what questions and insights um, you may be discovering by going through that audit and applying some of the recommendations that Colby has, has made from his site visits as well as if you have any questions for all of that information that you just heard. A lot, I know. And also, I just want to reiterate that we're going to send the PowerPoint out so you can go back and review, and there will also be a recording. Thanks, Abby. Great. Colby, Colby continues to be available to us and to all of you uh, as, as you have questions throughout the rest of the certification process. So Colby's not going anywhere, even though he's in the Rocky Mountains right now. But how uh, those of you that are on the call from your different schools, um, has the energy audit been helpful and what, what insights, uh, what did you learn? from that audit. Anyone? I, I do see it. Uh, Laurel Kearns had a question, T12 versus a T8. Uh, T12 is basically, um, it's, it's 8 twelfths or it's 12 eighths of an inch, but they're the thick 40 watt bulbs they no longer make anymore. A T8 typically is a 32 watt bulb or 8 eighths of an inch that many is now a baseline bulb that people are moving away from to more LED bulbs. So that's what a T8 linear fluorescent versus a T12 is. I'm wondering if anyone has met um, a resistance with their energy audit. Um, we received just in terms of the, uh, you know, questioning of, you know, the board might be willing to spend the money on the things that would be, um, you know, within a three year payback, but the lar longer payback is harder for us to, to invest in uh, those sorts of things. And I'm just wondering if anyone else has gone through that and um, how they've addressed that. Right, and Colby, could I go ahead and have you remove the screen share? Oh, did I not do it yet? How do I, I don't even know how to do it. Sorry, guys. Stop share, there we go. That's okay. Is that good? That's on, I got it. Yeah. And, and I can Great answer question. that question too. Aaron. I, I mean, I get it many, most places we go to, um, the admin, it's kind of separate from facility management and green team. So they don't see the value in it as much as the green team or the sustainability team might do. But typically every audit, we break into three categories, a no cost, a low cost, and the capital expense. And I know the capital expense typically has, you know, you're gonna to have to replace the boiler sometime. You're gonna to have to replace the HVAC sometime. Um, and I understand that a $300,000 investment with a 10 year payback is not as attractive, but there are rebates through your utility companies that can break that down to seven years, eight years. So I encourage you to look in your utility bills on that too. But I, you know, everywhere we go, we, we, I mean, that's, I understand that's a, that's a business decision and a 10 year payback. That's a long payback. Although for HVAC it's pretty good. The kind of pushback we got is the kind of um, man hours needed from facilities for a lot of this. And they feel like they're already stretched thin. 
And so, whereas they were agreeable, okay, we can get money even to cover some of these things, it was when it came to the amount of labor that we ran into real problems. Um, and so mm. one of the reasons I was asking about the difference between T12s and T8s is they've been sort of replacing things in the dorms when the, it arises, the opportunity, but they don't know how many or what. And so we're trying to do some of that labor for them by um, having students, you know, report what's in their room or um, having, you know, dorm RA sort of go and check things. So that's why I was asking if there's an easy visual way to teach people so we could get a report and then sort of target these um, apartments need the most for so that maybe when they're in there for a different reason it's not that much more effort to to say oh yeah and let's replace these so I think that's that was an interesting one I hadn't expected was wow. the pushback on we've got you know we're embedded in a university so the the larger university and the college their needs take priority over hours when they're stressed. I see that all the time as well. I, uh, typically a facility manager, I don't know if the facility manager is still on, on, the, on the phone or in the conference call, but they're wearing a number of different hats. So it's hard for them to be in a proactive mode, you know, because they're in reactive mode. Like at Gordon Conwell, we have, you know, uh, 1,500, 2,000 students, but we have four facility managers. So all their time is putting up maintenance calls, shoveling snow. So I understand that we get that all the time. So I'm a big believer with the upper administration to invest because there's a quick payback on it when done right uh, into facility management. But there's other things that you can do too um, with lighting. Now T12 to, over to T8s is hard because you have to change the entire fixture. But moving from a T8, to an LED plug and play. That's something that's very simple and can be done in house. And if I remember, y'all have T8, uh, Laurel at Drew. So that's something that could be done. I think, I think you listed, I mean, that was it. You, we did, you know, we saw just a couple of rooms and, and sort of guesstimated. And I think we listed a lot of T12s and T10s. So that yeah. we're trying to now figure out something more specific. I can send you a uh, uh, some kind of attachment that can t show you the difference visually between a T12 and a T8. Thanks. That might be able to help your green team. Yeah, so we're just trying to think of ways that students or, you know, uh, hired students even or staff can do some of it that, um, makes it more specific for our facilities folks because right. Colby would that be something that would be you think would be helpful for us to share with all of our schools yeah absolutely um, and there's a you know I can okay. get more than just lighting because that's a big issue the the facility managers only have so many hours in the day and I completely understand um, it's hard to be proactive and save energy when they don't have any time or resources to do that Hopefully the energy audit helps to do that, but yeah. And I'd love cool. to hear what people are doing about the um, behavior part of it, because behavior is a huge issue for us. Um, that when Colby came, we, you know, it was June, we walked into several rooms where <laughs> the air conditioning's going and the windows are open because somebody has decided it's too cold or whatever. And, and then we have bathrooms that people lift the windows on all the time, I think for, you know, right. aesthetic, we might well, say. And Colby, yeah, and Colby has emphasized the importance of the behavior. So yeah, how are people approaching that? Right. I'm, I mean, I see. I'm happy to talk, but maybe somebody else wants to talk. <laughs> and you may need to unmute if, if you have something to add from other schools. We've heard from Drew. 
uh, Garrett, Columbia, UBL, uh, Austin. Who else do I see on here? I have a question. Okay, who's um, that? Oh, that, Heather at Austin. Your, yeah, um, on the on your slide presentation, Colby, you mentioned behavior and um, what was it about turning out the light? Said um, if you're going to leave for X amount of time. Twenty three seconds. Twenty three seconds. Twenty. Well, I think just just getting that word out. Um, you know, going down to the restroom, it's worth turning off the lights. Um, and I've, I've tried hard to talk to folks around here about, um, you know, what their computer does when they walk away. I, I work late. I see computers glowing at all uh, hours of day and night. Um, and so I, I suspect that's drawing a lot of energy, too. Yep. Uh, you know, things you can do is uh, putting a, just above a light switch. We did it at Gordon Conwell and a lot of the other seminaries did it. Just a reminder to turn off your lights and then maybe put that fat 23 second rule um, underneath it. And because you, you know, some people worry about the burnout because if I'm turning my pictures on and off continuously, that's really not the fact. Um, if you're gone longer than 23 seconds, it pays to turn it off. Uh, motion sensors do help with that, but there's a cost to that. The thing about behavior, if you can teach the staff to do that and the, the employees, and, and that's something they can take home with them and do at home or at church, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, same thing with computers. Um, screen savers don't save a lot of energy. Turning your computer off in the tower, turning that off or implementing a, a free software program from Energy Star you have to go through your IT, but that can also, you know, after say a certain certain time, it turns every computer off. And you, you know, most colleges have, you know, a couple thousand computers, not including laptops. So that makes a big impact. Part of the plug load items. Very good. Any other schools have any questions or comments? Can I ask a, Colby, can I ask you a question about the computers? Yeah. So if lights are 23 seconds, what for laptops? What's the That's like, magic good number for laptops? Question. Now, what it used to be, it used to be a number, but that's one of those big computers. You know, now they're flat screen and energy efficient. And most of the people have laptops. So I don't know what that, that is. And it's not as impactful as it was when we all had the big computers. But I can I can find that and send it to you, and maybe we can all send that through an email to the GSI. Right. I have one more question. One of the things. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Um, one of the things we have been. It's hard to hear you, Laurel. Sorry, is this better? Yes. Yes. Um, the kind of things that keep water hot or, um, I don't know, it just seemed like there were several of those things that would be really smart to have turn off at night or on weekends. And we, a lot of that is student run. We have a little cafe in our building. Um, are there programmable things that would turn those off so we aren't relying on students to remember to shut them down you can yeah you can add time clocks to your domestic hot water tanks for students that's harder to do but in you know when you know the hours in a typical facility so 8 a.m to 6 p.m you can do a time clock put a time clock on an electric domestic hot water tank and that would because right now if you think about it most churches, they just need hot water on Sunday. I know seminaries are different, but now that unit is running 24-7, 365 to maintain 120 degrees. So there's things like that. Um, it's harder for students unless they have a domestic hot water tank in their apartment. It's yeah, harder I, for them to control. I should clarify. I meant things like the, the water for the coffee maker, um, those kind of things that is keeping water sort of hot for instant demand. 
Um, and it doesn't need to do that all night long, certainly. Sure. Uh, or weekends. And I'm just wondering if there's ways that you can plug something in and it's got a timer, I guess. I guess I have a timer for my lights when I go away. So I could do something. We could do something like that. You could. Uh, yeah, there's a couple. I mean, you can unplug it, but I, there's the behavior thing. You can implement a plug load adapter when it senses that it's not being used or it's not needed, then it'll cut that voltage. It's, it's motion activated, motion sensitive. And so there's things like that on coffee pots, microwaves, other items like that. Because like you said, that's expensive to maintain, right. you know, hot right. water on coffee right. pot for X, y, X amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we are right at the end of the hour. Uh, I, there may have been, I, I'm, I'm still thinking that we may want to have some time, perhaps on another call, uh, to talk in more detail about Portfolio Manager. It seems like our school, we, of the 13 schools that are in the program right now, we're kind of all over the map as to our level of understanding uh, and um, on, on what all that has to offer. Uh, but real quickly, I mean, I, um, Um, station part one and we want, may want another one just like this uh, where we can focus more on preventive maintenance and renewables uh, because there is so much, uh, so much. Uh, information and um, um, so I, I think to be respectful of everyone's time we probably need to to wrap it up but again grateful for uh, the great report from Garrett uh, Evangelical and your green team, uh, and we've shared that website, uh, the liturgy website, which is just remarkable and very rich uh, and creative. And uh, this uh, PowerPoint will be shared with you as well as the recording of the call. Colby, uh, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Nobody fell Again, no call. Take a break in August, but keep the balls rolling on the certification process. Abby and I aren't going anywhere. We're always available to help you, but there will not be a monthly cohort call in August. So uh, we'll see you in September. Stay cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.